In a quiet village in 1800s England, investigators analyzed the genius boy who studied death like a science. Then he vanished, leaving behind only his journals and a haunting device that no one could decipher. He's only eight, but that drawing, it's like something from a surgeon's manual, whispered the schoolmaster, holding up the parchment with trembling fingers. The year was 1871, in the quiet village of Luddendale, nestled deep in the rural hills of Lancashire, England. Children played stickball near the river. Church bells rang on Sundays. Everything moved slowly, except for the mind of Edward Halley. At just eight years old, Edward barely spoke during class. He wasn't rude, just focused. While other boys fidgeted over arithmetic, Edward filled the back of his slate with anatomical sketches, such as spines, muscle tissue, and arterial branches. Once, he drew the cross-section of the brain, labeling it with words he'd never been taught in school. He was the son of Margaret Halley, a widowed seamstress who worked tirelessly mending coats for the local estate. Edward's father, a chimney sweep, had died of alcohol poisoning two years prior. Since then, the boy had become increasingly isolated. At first, no one noticed when he began spending his afternoons at the edge of the field behind the parsonage, observing the decay of small animals, birds, rodents, even a dead lamb once struck by lightning. He documented everything. He noted skin color changes, bloating patterns, and insect behaviors. The village physician, Dr. Alwyn Pierce, was the only one who saw something extraordinary in Edward. When Edward approached him after church one day and asked for books on cellular rot, Dr. Pierce raised an eyebrow, but obliged. What harm could an anatomy manual do? Weeks later, Edward walked into Dr. Pierce's surgery practice with a folded drawing in his hand. It's your patient, he said flatly. The blacksmith's wife. She's going to die soon. Dr. Pierce frowned. Why would you say that? Edward opened the drawing. It was an accurate sketch of a swollen appendix, complete with pressure lines. She's got this. You didn't check her stomach properly. When the woman passed three days later from a ruptured appendix, the doctor sat down in silence. He wasn't sure what disturbed him more, the boy's accuracy or how calmly he'd accepted the news. Word spread fast. Some townsfolk crossed the road when they saw Edward. Others muttered things like, marked by death, or godless child. Margaret shielded him from the noise, but even she couldn't ignore that her son didn't see death as something to fear. To him, it was data. He called it the after process. He believed that death followed rules, patterns, measurable laws, just like anything else in science. By November 1871, Edward's reputation had spread far beyond Lancashire. A letter arrived bearing the seal of the London Society of Scientific Progress, they were sending a representative to investigate the boy's work. The visitor was Professor Theodore Gray, a tall, blunt man in his 40s, known for pioneering studies in forensic pathology. He had published papers on time-of-death estimation and had an open mind, but he wasn't prepared for Edward Halley. On the day of his arrival, Edward sat with Dr. Pierce and Professor Gray in an office, dissecting a dead sparrow on a linen cloth. He looked up only once and asked, are you here to learn or to stop me? Gray was taken aback. I'm here to understand, he replied. That week, Gray observed the boy's work. Edward had filled entire notebooks with sketches and handwritten observations. How cold air affected lividity. How maggots first emerged behind the ears of corpses. How blood pooled differently depending on posture. In one journal, he had compared body temperature decay over time using various animals. He'd measured how long it took for a piglet's organs to stiffen after death in both winter and summer. And he had mapped it out to the minute. It's impossible, Gray murmured, flipping through one of the pages. These are theories we're only just beginning to explore. The most chilling moment came when Edward brought up a baby rabbit. I want to know when the light leaves, he said softly. Gray paused. The what? To which Edward replied, the moment between being and not being. The brain keeps working for a few seconds after the heart stops. I think I can find it. 
Dr. Pierce tried to intervene, but the boy was already sketching a rudimentary brainwave chart. His mind isn't twisted, Gray whispered to the doctor. It's precise, borderline brilliant, but I fear he doesn't sleep. Indeed, Margaret later revealed that Edward would often wake in the middle of the night, scribbling by candlelight, speaking aloud to no one. Not yet. Not yet. It's not gone yet. The London Society sent word for further observation. However, they weren't the only ones taking interest. Villagers were starting to grow nervous. Stories of the death child had begun appearing in northern broadsheets. One rumor claimed he had a devil's eye. One morning, Margaret found her laundry line cut. A note was pinned to her door. He's not natural. Send him away before something worse comes. But Edward wasn't afraid. He was preparing for something. Something even he didn't fully understand yet. By January 1872, Edward and his mother were relocated under a quiet arrangement to a private estate owned by the London Society, just outside Cambridge. It was safer there, away from villagers and their suspicion. The house had a cellar, unused servant quarters, and a modest study with wide windows, which Edward immediately took to. Professor Gray personally oversaw the transition. He's not a specimen, he told the others. He's a colleague. In the new study, Edward arranged his notes chronologically, over 200 pages of diagrams, handwritten decay formulas, and predictions. Every dead insect, every bird, even fallen leaves, were documented for how they died, how they broke down, and how long it took. His handwriting was tiny, neat, and mechanical, but what stunned the scientific team was what he had written in the margins. He's calculating backwards from time of death, said Dr. Lydia Cowan, a scholar in biochemical decomposition, using environmental data, soil temperature, airflow. This is forensic methodology. One day, a drowned boy was pulled from the river cam. Scotland Yard requested Gray's assistance. Edward overheard. I want to help, he said quietly. Gray hesitated. It's a delicate case. I already calculated. Judging by river temp and stomach swelling, he was submerged less than two hours. The officials agreed reluctantly, and Edward stood beside two seasoned coroners in a cold examination chamber. He spoke little, only to point out inconsistencies. His final estimate for time of death? One hour and 45 minutes. The official post-mortem placed it at one hour and 51 minutes. The silence in the room was thicker than the fog outside. Edward didn't smile for his correct prediction. He simply made a new entry in his notebook. That night, Margaret entered his room to find him drawing a human face, but the eyes were grayed out, and the head was marked with tiny symbols. The paper read, Last expression remains in the facial nerves for seven seconds. Edward's next fascination would push even Professor Gray's tolerance. Edward had become fixated on something he called the interval, a sliver of time so small it couldn't be seen between the heart's final beat and the brain's last flicker of thought. In the spring of 1872, he began a personal experiment. He isolated himself in the old servant's quarters, claiming he needed quiet for precision. For weeks, he observed mice under varying conditions. Margaret, devastated, begged Gray to stop him. But Gray, too, was curious. He believes the body doesn't shut off like a switch, he said. He thinks it fades. Edward crafted a device using melted wax, metal tubing, and copper wire. It resembled an hourglass but with strange adjustments. He called it a thought catcher. He claimed it could detect the final flicker of life energy in the moment after death, using only pressure changes and copper tension. It was nonsense to most, but the boy defended it with calm logic and an unsettling level of detail. I don't care where the soul goes, he said to Dr. Cowan, but if it goes anywhere at all, I want to see which direction. One evening, Gray entered Edward's study and found dozens of labeled sketches. Three seconds after, six seconds, eight seconds. Each diagram showed subtle differences in pupil size, limb rigidity, and nerve twitches. This isn't science anymore, Cowan warned. It's obsession. And it was. Edward stopped eating during the day. He only slept in small bursts waking to jot down ideas and return to his diagrams. He avoided sunlight, 
preferring the cellar, where conditions were cool and consistent for what he called terminal analysis. Margaret finally confronted Gray. You've all taken him too far. He doesn't speak like a child. He doesn't cry. He doesn't laugh. But Edward, overhearing, gently placed a note in her hand. It read, I don't want to feel. I want to know. The next morning, Margaret found a robin placed gently on her sewing stool. A note beside it read, I just need to know where it goes. That was the last time she would see him act like a child, because not long after, he disappeared. The morning of May 20th, 1872, was calm, pale, and unremarkable, until Margaret noticed her son's breakfast untouched. His bed was neatly made, the candles still half-melted, and Edward's journals gone. No footprints led from the house, no open windows, not even a displaced chair. At first, Professor Gray believed the boy had simply hidden himself somewhere on the grounds. A dozen men searched every corridor, loft, and cellar. They drained the nearby pond, combed the orchard, and even checked the old chimney flues. Nothing. On Edward's desk lay a single folded envelope sealed with wax, addressed to Dr. Alwyn Pierce, the first man who had lent him books. Inside was a technical sketch, lines, valves, and a glass chamber shaped eerily like a human coffin, but with coils and notations no one in the room could decipher. At the top, in careful handwriting, were the words, Preservation of the Moment of Departure. Gray's hands trembled as he read. It described a process of temperature regulation, air isolation, and submersion, early cryostasis, decades before the concept even existed. Margaret collapsed at the sight of it. He's killed himself, she whispered. But Gray shook his head. No, he planned something. A formal inquest began. Detectives from Cambridge arrived, along with members of the London Society of Scientific Progress, alarmed by the boy's disappearance. Reporters gathered at the gates, scribbling headlines before facts emerged. Within a week, newspapers across England carried variations of the same headline. Investigators analyzed the genius boy who studied death like science, then he vanished. They searched riverbanks for months, but no body surfaced. Only his thought catcher was found half buried near the back garden. Its copper wires still coiled tightly as if it had recorded something before being buried. In the aftermath, Margaret refused to leave the estate. Every creak at night made her rise with hope. Gray often sat outside her door, unable to forgive himself. I treated him like a colleague, he said, when he needed a childhood. Decades after Edward's disappearance, a gray-haired Professor Gray sat alone in a lecture hall, addressing a small group of young physicians. You all measure time of death using the Halley Decay Index, he said softly. But you never met the boy who created it. In his older years, Gray had transformed guilt into purpose. He gathered Edward's surviving pages, restored his sketches, and founded the Halley Initiative, a modest institution dedicated to teaching forensic observation to children gifted in science safely, ethically, and compassionately. Edward's notes became part of an investigation archive where all of his calculations, including temperature decay curves, gas pressure graphs, and time of death estimations, matched modern forensic equations exactly. The discovery was published in a medical journal, crediting Edward Halley, 1871, as the source of the earliest consistent formulas for post-mortem interval estimation. Margaret lived long enough to see the first students of the Halley Initiative arrive in 1889. She walked slowly through the corridors lined with her son's restored notebooks. On one wall hung his final quote, inked in delicate script. If you want to know where the light goes when the candle dies, you don't ask the darkness. You ask the smoke. Decades later, in the modern age, historians would revisit Edward Halley's life as one of the earliest examples of precocious scientific genius misread as madness. His work became foundational to the forensic principle that every death leaves measurable evidence. His formulas are still referenced in crime scene manuals under the acronym HTE, the Halley Thermic Equation. But beyond the numbers and studies, his story endures because it asks a question deeper than any equation. 
How much knowledge can a child bear before it breaks the soul that carries it? Some claim Edward's body was never found because he never died. Others believe he built his preservation chamber and perished inside it during an experiment gone wrong. A few, more romantic, say he simply stepped across the invisible line he'd studied all his life, the interval between breath and silence, and found what he was looking for. When the Halley Institute reopened Edwards' archives in 1983, a caretaker discovered a small wooden box sealed within the original foundation. Inside were sheets of parchment untouched by time. On the first was a single phrase, written in the same meticulous handwriting. The interval is real. And so the mystery of Edward Halley remains, a boy who treated death not as darkness, but as science, who turned fear into curiosity, and whose disappearance left the world not haunted, but humbled. Because sometimes the greatest discoveries aren't found in laboratories or libraries. They're left behind by those who vanish, trying to understand what the rest of us can only accept. Do you think a child can truly understand death, let alone study it like science? Thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more stories that leave us questioning everything we thought we knew. See you in the next video.